Good day, guys. One of you, Isaac, shout out, sent me this Training Peaks article on Instagram regarding using carbohydrates in training, and I really couldn't help but make a video on it in true fashion. Two things about this article you'll notice. First thing is there's not a single reference to a paper throughout the entire article. So essentially, it's just an opinion piece. And keep in mind, this author, which was on the Training Peaks website, is more of an ultra endurance style coach. So that will impact the lens that they're looking at this from. This is, as you guys would know, this is a cycling channel. We're looking at guys racing, guys doing club rides, more higher intensity work. So we're gonna look at this article through the road cyclist lens. So let's get into it. Quoting from the article here, I will read this out. Although aerobic training in and of itself improves the body's ability to burn a greater percentage of fat, more coaches and athletes are beginning to recognize that how you eat during training can influence this equation. This means that if you are constantly replenishing with gels during your training, you may not be training your body to utilize fat as efficiently as it could. So this is where a different strategy for training versus racing can be beneficial. In summary, this author is saying that by consuming carbohydrates during all your training, you may not be getting all the benefits in terms of fat utilization. So what does the science actually say is best practice regarding that? I'm gonna quote from Tim Podlegar's summary article, and it says here, the capacity to oxidize fat should naturally come together with improved training status. And specific manipulations of training and nutrition to alter fat oxidation rates during exercise should only be considered once the desired training status has been achieved. In other words, increasing fat oxidation rates as such should not come in the front of the goal to improve one's aerobic capacity, especially in the light of evidence demonstrating that training with low carbohydrate availability can result in reduced ability to exercise at high intensities due to the reduced ability to utilize carbohydrates. Done. Essentially, should you train with lower carbohydrate availability to increase your fat oxidation? No. You should just consume carbohydrates as needed to meet the demands of the exercise so that you can sustain your training, do more aerobic training, get more aerobic adaptations, and you will then oxidize more fat from being fitter. The hidden upside of that, as Tim Podlegar says, is you then don't run the risk of having low energy availability by doing this training with a restricted carbohydrate demand. Second part of the Training Peaks article I'll read through here. There is rarely a need to take in calories during any workout under 90 minutes, especially moderate intensity workouts. This means most of your training under 90 minutes and certainly under an hour can be done without supplemental nutrition. It's after 90 minutes that the need and desire to refuel becomes more pressing, but you can expand that time frame to two and a half hours or longer. During early base training, I try to extend my long runs up to two and a half hours without any supplemental calories. Of course, you should always drink water and may need some electrolytes in hot conditions. Again, I'm gonna quote Tim Bodlikar's summary article, which is essentially the best we have in science right now regarding using carbohydrates for training. There has been substantial investigation into the role of commencing selected exercise sessions with reduced carbohydrate availability to provide a beneficial stimulus for training adaptation. However, a contemporary view of the train low approach based on the totality of the current evidence suggests limited utility for enhancing performance benefits from training, but that its main benefit may lie in time efficiency. And that's it. It's pretty simple, guys. You're doing training. Just take in carbohydrates as you need them, depending on the intensity of the exercise. You will recover better from the training. You'll have quicker turnaround between sessions because you'll be using less endogenous carbohydrates. And therefore, your training will be, better, will be better, it'll be more sustainable, and you'll get fitter in the long run. You don't need to worry about doing your rides just on water to try and get more of a training benefit. Your training is already stimulating enough. <laughs> so just recover from it better. The only situation I could see, to be fair to the author, where someone should be training to utilize fat by restricting carbohydrates during training is someone who is already as fit as they can get with the time they have available to train, and they're looking for a marginal gain because they have absolutely no more time to train, so they can't actually get any fitter. That's where you could look at it. Pretty much you and I, and pretty much anyone watching this video, 
is just going to get fitter from training more and staying healthy. Simple as that. Next quote from the article. Abstaining from these gels or bars during long runs and bikes can be difficult at first, but the more experience you have with it, the better your body adapts mentally and physically. Of course, that's the idea. You want your body to rely less on supplemental carbohydrates during those efforts. Nevertheless, you will not always feel fabulous during these efforts as your body's carbohydrate stores deplete. But there is benefit to gaining experience with those low points during training because they inevitably come in races, even in races where you stick to a consistent refueling strategy. Again, just not a productive take on what the science says. So, firstly, quote from... Tim Bodlegar's second research article where they were looking at rates of endogenous and exogenous carbohydrate oxidation during exercise. The primary aim of carbohydrate ingestion during prolonged endurance exercise is to A, reduce reliance on endogenous carbohydrate stores and or to maintain sufficient carbohydrate availability by the provision of exogenous carbohydrates. So the author in that Training Peaks article that said, You want your body to rely less on supplemental carbohydrates during those efforts. That is the opposite. What you want to do when you're training, even in an endurance ride, is to be consuming carbohydrates, glucose and fructose mix, ideally. Your body then burns those exogenous carbohydrates, meaning the ones you're taking in and eating. That then spares the endogenous carbohydrates, your muscle and your liver glycogen. So you're burning through more of what you're eating, less of those precious stores you've got in your muscles. Therefore, at the end of the session, you're less fatigued. You're going to have a better turnaround time for subsequent training sessions. That's the whole point of these glucose and fructose mixes that we have. It's because they allow high rates of exogenous carbohydrate oxidation, meaning you can go out for a three or four hour ride. And if you're consuming carbohydrates, you can be burning very little of your muscle glycogen and you'll be way better off in that position throughout an entire training week. Other sentence I'll just hone in on here as well. Author says there is benefit to gaining experience with these low points during training because they inevitably come in races. Here's a hypothetical. Should you, A, not consume carbohydrates during some of your training sessions so you get used to the feeling of bonking, or B, Consume more carbohydrates during your long training sessions to train your gut to uptake more carbohydrates and therefore have a greater performance in your races. If it's me and we have the athletes I coach, I'm going B because the gut is trainable. Quote from Asket Dukendrop's Training the Gut for Athletes article. Evidence also shows that the diet has an impact on the capacity of the intestine to absorb nutrients. Again, the adaptations that occur appear to be nutrient specific. For example, a high carbohydrate diet will increase the density of sodium dependent glucose 1 transporters in the intestine as well as the activity of those transporters, allowing greater carbohydrate absorption and oxidation during exercise. So all those little transporters in your gut that suck up the carbohydrates and put them into your bloodstream, you can get more of them and they can function better if you train your gut by consuming carbohydrates. Based on the science, that is a much better approach than just training yourself to be good at bonking. (laughs) You know, that makes no sense. So how do you train your gut? Uh, Here's a quick chart from Ask a Duke and Drop in that uh, paper. Training the gut method. You've got training with relatively large volumes of fluid to train the stomach. That results in reduced bloating and fullness during exercise. You can also train immediately after a meal. You can train with relatively high carbohydrate intake during exercise. You can simulate the race with a race nutrition plan. Very important. Practicing taking in 90, 100, 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour with that 1 to 0.8 ratio, 1 to 1 ratio of fructose and glucose. And then you can also increase, just generally increase carbohydrate content of the diet that results in all of these physiological effects, which have these benefits. So in summary, how many carbohydrates should you eat before and during your session? Well, Tim Podlegar sort of answered this for us. This is from his summary paper. We've got the duration less than 90 minutes or above 90 minutes. We've got the intensity up the top of the ride you're doing, moderate being zone 2 or below heavy being between zone two and zone four, 
And then you've got severe being zone five or VO2 max and above, so high intensity intervals, those sorts of things. He also considers fueling for a ride to be taking into account what you're having directly before the session and then during the session. You can see his recommendations here. For reference, by high, high he means 90 grams per hour or potentially above if you're a bigger athlete with a higher power output, you may want to go up to 120 grams per hour if you've trained yourself to deal with that. Moderate to high, that's going to be between 60 and 90 grams per hour. Again, if you're going above 60 grams per hour, you want a glucose and fructose mix. As you can see from this chart, even the easiest ride on here, which is less than 90 minutes and zone two or below, he still recommends having some carbohydrate before the session. And then you can probably get away with not having anything come in if it's a zone two or below. So next time you go for a session, you can kind of use this chart to help you out. If you have any questions on that, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'm happy to reply if, if anything here doesn't make sense to you. Hope you enjoyed this video, guys. Learned something along the way and got something out of it. And I'll catch you in the next one.